there is a certain way I begin. I think it goes like this. I am here with the wonderful Carolyn Pfeiffer, whose last name is spelled P-F-E-I-F-F-E-R. Very good. And it is September 14th, right. 2012. And, and Carolyn is C-A-R-O-L-Y-N. Okay, Carolyn is C-A-R-L-O-Y-N. No, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N. C-A-R-O-L-Y-N. Yeah. And we are in the Marfa Public Library movie theater. Right. Okay, um, so let's just start with this. I met you in Marfa, and I'm from Los Angeles, and you're kind of from Los Angeles. So when did you come here, and why? I came here five years ago this summer Mm -hmm. um, to live, but I first came out, I was was scouting locations for a film that never got made, and the title of that film was The Marfa Lights, and it had absolutely nothing to do with The Marfa Lights, but it was a project that Terrence Malick and Ed Pressman had developed um, with the intention of producing, and... I, at the time that they sent us the material, was had been bought to the University of Texas, Austin, to set up a program called Burnt Orange Productions, where film students out of the University of Texas worked alongside of professional filmmakers. And um, it was going to be our first project. Um, however, we had our money, they didn't have their money, and it got kept being pushed off. And it got pushed off every four years, it got pushed off... I mean, every year we get pushed, pushed off another year for four years, and then finally all of the funding of Burnt Orange uh, came to an end, and we never got to make the movie, which makes me so sad. But I, I met Marfa, and I fell in, light, in love with the light and the space like everybody else. Right. Well, I was in L.A. long enough to know that Terrence Malick is a big deal, and five years ago he was like some really unbelievably expensive vintage wine. How did you get involved with him? Um, they sent us the script. I was working with a man called Tom Schatz, who's the... Who is us? It's a little bit complicated, but um, the University of Texas, about about nine years ago, uh, there was a very uh, forward-thinking dean and president and head of development, and they were looking for ways to do venture philanthropy, if you will, Mm -hmm. and to find ways, much the way medical research does raise money for some universities. They were looking for alternative ways for the University of Texas to to do programs that would be stimulating for their students and also potentially become revenue generators that would feed back into the school. Okay. Okay. one of these ideas was to set up a film program where the students would apprentice an intern on professionally made independent films, okay. Austin-based films. And um, at the time, I was um, vice chair of the American Film Institute Conservatory, but I'd come from, from a background of filmmaking, of independent filmmaking, and they thought I was a good candidate to come down and run the for-profit side of this venture. The for-profit side of this venture was called Burnt Orange Productions, and it was it was actually a for-profit business owned by the University of Texas. It was a very, very complicated um, may, setup. May I ask, was this in essence the University of Texas trying to become a, a small film studio? In order to, yes, okay, but only in order to um, give their students opportunities to work in the industry, and and the downs and the and the the ultimate goal would be should any of these low budget independent films that we made be profitable that the investors would be repaid. The university was not investing in these pictures. We raised the money. They okay. helped us raise the money, but they did not put university money into it. So you're working on this project, which has one of my favorite directors, Terrence Malick, but he also is uh, almost objectively like one of the coolest directors. The only reason I'm hesitating is because you know his last film was booed. I know. Well, Malik was not going to direct this. He di- he was going to produce it. It's good enough for me. But I I'm actually <laughs> one of those people that got to meet Terrence Malik. Not huh. too many people do, and he is super cool. He's yeah, well, extremely bright and very very warm and engaging, which mm-hmm. 
you know, he's such a recluse. I mean, almost at the level of Howard Hughes. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one, I mean, he never, I mean, his films just opened in Venice and Toronto. Of course, he didn't attend anything, and everybody gets very, um, he never gives interviews and so forth, and so on. Nobody gets really upset, but, but it's, he never has. It's not like he's changed his mold. He's pretty much that way. Back to uh, you. But you came here uh, 2008-ish, I'm guessing? Uh, no. Let's see if it's... Yeah, I think 2007, I think it was. Yeah, it was five years ago. And that was before a lot of um, these more social establishments were invented, like Padres, Planet Marf, and whatever. Right. And yet you fell in love with it. And I'm wondering if you fell in love with it because as a movie person, you kind of saw it with the cinematographer eye. No doubt about it. The uh-huh. light and the space just blew me away. And I, I really didn't want to go back to Los Angeles. Yeah. I had lived in deep rural Jamaica for six years, uh, from 93 to 99. Uh-huh. My late husband and I had bought a, a, a wonderful old house in deep rural Jamaica, nine miles from... I mean, not nine miles, about maybe 10 or 12 miles from Nine Mile, and Nine Mile is where Bob Marley was born and where he's buried. Mm-hmm. And, um, in fact, Mrs. Sadella Marley came to the house once and spent the night. That was very thrilling. Wow. Mrs. Um, Sadella's a wife or a mother? Uh, Sadella, the mother. Oh, great. Sadella, the mother. Yeah, Rita's the wife. Uh-huh. Um, and there's another Sadella Marley who's the daughter named after her grandmother, Sadella. Um, and... And I grew up in a small town in the South, and I love small towns, and I love light and space and wildlife, and I, uh, you know, I, I really did not want to go back to the city. And now, with the internet and free conference calls, uh, I am able. I, I go to Los Angeles about every six weeks for maybe a week. And the rest of the time I work from here. And if I have to, if business takes me away, then I go away. And work is, we kind of bury the lead, but you're a producer. I'm a, I'm a film producer, yes. And a, a film producer of a lot of, uh, exo- I mean, I, I know your reputation precedes it. I know you've done stuff in Jamaica, which now fits because you have, live there. yes. In Los Angeles, in Marfa. Um, and I think your work in Marfa was very generous because it was my observation. You put in more hours than you could have possibly been paid for. Uh, well, I think all of us. That, that's the Marfa spirit. That's you know? the Marfa spirit. Yeah. But let's let's start with uh, the obvious. Where were you born? Where are you from? I was born in Washington D.C. Me too. Georgetown Hospital. Georgetown Hospital. Yes, dude. Oh Get out God. of here. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what year though. You don't need to. Okay. I haven't asked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're kidding me. I think I don't remember meeting anybody else ever that was born in Georgetown Hospital except for my brother. You know, <laughs> I never joke, so um, I was. <laughs> okay. Okay. What were you doing in Washington, D.C.? I grew up in the D.C. area. Okay. And, you know, lived in various parts. My mom latest lived in Virginia. We mostly lived in uh, the Thesda Chevy Chase area. And I lived in D.C., you know, Georgetown for... All around. Well, I was born there, and we left when I was about six, I think, and moved to North Carolina, which is where I grew up, and which okay. was where my mother's fam- my mother had come from, and where her family lived. And um, I left. I that school system pushed me ahead, so I was pushed ahead a year, and I was already ahead a year, just because I was a January baby. So it was like a year and a half ahead. Mm-hmm. And so I came out of high school at 16 and went off to a Quaker college in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, for two years. And then I wanted to see the world. So my parents felt I was too young to go to the big city, to New York, and they allowed me. parents wouldn't, though. True true enough, true enough. That's part of being a parent. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So my first job, my first paying job was I was an assistant window dresser in a department store. Mm -hmm. And I saved my money, and and I think I was being paid $40 a week or something, so I still managed to save my money. And I ended up in New York a year later, and I lived in New York for a year, and I saved my money, and I bought a one-way ticket to Europe. And I lived in Europe for 16 years. Holy smokes, where in Europe? Uh, four years in Rome, four years in Paris, and eight years in London. And almost a year in Spain, because I worked on Dr. Shivago. So, and then I came back to the States, and then I started producing. But I was working, when I got to Europe, I started working in the movie business. But in, in you know, modest capacities that were 
appropriate for my age and experience. I was a movie star to, uh, I was a, and a secretary. We were secretaries in those days to Claudia Cardinale and Omar Sharif. And then I started a PR company and I had a very auspicious client list. This was in London. Mm-hmm. And I handled Apple Corps, which was the Beatles company, and I had clients like Barbara Streisand and Robert It's like you're Robert looking at all my weak spots, but I have to let you keep speaking because we're limited. But we're, I have so many questions. Okay. Um, and after eight years of doing that, I moved back to the States and started producing. And I went to work with someone I had met through my PR company, a man called Shep Gordon, who was a music manager, and he had clients like Alice Cooper and eventually Blondie and other people. Mm-hmm. And and I started in a company called Alive Enterprises, and I started the film company of Alive Enterprises called Alive Films with Shep. And we were partners for years, and then we joined forces with Chris Blackwell and formed Island Alive, and we did movies like, or released movies like Kiss of the Spider Woman, and we did a bunch of Alan Rudolph movies, and we did Kleana Scotsy and Stop Making Sense, and a lot of those great films of the 80s. I mean, we were really, we were doing very, very well, and it was very, very exciting. And then, alas, the partners fell out, and I was kind of left in the middle, mm-hmm. um, and and these things happen, and you you know if you're growing up, you just keep moving on. Right. So I kept on doing movies, and eventually, and I got married, mm-hmm. had a baby, sadly lost my husband, who was a really um, dynamite guy, a man called John Bradshaw. He was a war correspondent and a mm-hmm. writer and a, a contributing editor to Esquire, and a great friend of Christopher Hitchens. And he I know um, the name. You know, you may well have read his stuff. I mean, he wrote some really fabulous stuff back in the 80s. And I was, well, I will discuss You were probably a young boy then, though. Mm, I might surprise you. You were still reading. (laughs) I might surprise you with my age. I stopped reading a long time ago, so I've I've lived backwards. Oh, okay. 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 I'm not sure what that means, but you're going to explain it to me later. Mm -hmm. Um, And didn't they make a movie about that, David Fincher? I don't know. I got the idea from Merlin the Magician. Okay, okay. Now that's interesting. Okay. Um, and then came back to the States. Um, dis- oh, oh, and then moved to Jamaica. My husband passed away. We had bought this home in Jamaica. Our dream had been to go to Jamaica and live in Jamaica. And so I ended up taking my daughter. and Who I've met. Who you've met. In Los Angeles. That's right. Mm-hmm. And um, she was a little Jamaican schoolgirl for six years. And... In her little Jamaican uniform and everything, and then and then started TCBY Frozen Yogurt franchise. Built four stores, airport in, outlet in Jamaica. in Jamaica. Produced three Jamaican movies. Oh, uh, now I'm sorry, I didn't get in. Uh, I, I should have spoken to her more. Oh yes, I wonder she speaks patois. Oh, I missed um, that. And she spoke to me in English. Oh well, she wouldn't know to speak to you in patois. Okay, well she. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry to cut you off. Do you parlez vous français and italiano and all these things? Si. Mm. Parlo italiano si, et je oui. parle français. Okay. okay. I so. mean, it could be better. I've been removed from the language a long time now. My Spanish is not good. This I'm, is what I, you know what? It's good enough. This is what I tell people if they ask me if I speak Spanish. My, my mom is from Mexico. I say, well, it depends. Do you speak Spanish? And if they say no, then I say, yes, I'm fluent. And if they say yes, I say, I'm still learning. That's a very good answer. Yeah. <laughs> so we left off in uh, Jamaica with the daughter. In Jamaica. And husband. then um, for events I won't go into, I uh, ended up coming back to Los Angeles to become the founding president of the Los Angeles Film School. And... Wow. Now, I have to tell you something. Should I? Okay, I had a, a friend from Jamaica who went to the Los Angeles. Film oh, I School. bet you they're a friend of mine. Bruce Hart. Bruce Hart, I know well. We know someone in Jamaica together? We do. I love her. He was a little wacky. He's completely wacky. He thought I was wacky. Can you imagine? Well, you know, you're, <laughs> you're birds of a feather. What can I say? And do you know. Carolyn Pfeiffer. Yes. Back on the record. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, anyway, we know Bruce Hart in common. We um, do. And we, you, you left Jamaica when? Uh, I left Jamaica in, dear me, let's see, 2001, I think. And then to Los Angeles with you? To L.A. Wait a minute, let me think now. I was in, no, I was in Jamaica from 2000, from nine, 2000, no, from 90, 93 to 99, then back to L.A., and I worked at the L.A. Film School until 2001, and then I worked at AFI until 2003, and then... 
Texas 2003, I mean, uh, UT 2003 to 2007, and MARFA 2007 to date. And producing all the while. Here's a question. Yeah. What, what do you, and I'll, I'll help you out with Well, it. not producing when I was running the film schools. Okay, well, I'm yeah. going to give you help with this question because it yeah. fits in. What do you suppose your skill is? Because I see it, uh, given what you've just given me as your history and knowing a little bit about the business, as a gift for organization. That is exactly what my skill is. Okay. Yeah. Be- because I'm a it, producer. You're a producer, and also the job you had when you were a teenager in North Carolina, like shop windows, that is basically production. You know, it's like you put this here, we got to get some clothes for this guy, you know, this yeah. thing isn't facing yeah. the right direction. I'm a behind-the-camera person. Mm-hmm. And it's always been what I, it's what I do, it's what I do best, it's, what's, it's what my passion is. I can't help myself, you know. I mean, I was at a, a, a farewell party for Maggie from the library the other day, and the mayor was standing there, and he was saying, what time do I speak? And I instantly started producing the event, and I just happened to be standing there. And I, <laughs> Renee, mayor wants to do his presentation. Let's get over here. Let's get this organized. I can't, I can't help myself. Well, you got to Marfa, you like the light, and we've... Uh, Karen Bernstein very generously loaned me her guest house for about 10 days. How did you know her? I knew Karen from UT because she was um, a documentary maker living and working in Austin when I was there. Mm -hmm. And we became friends. And I remember when Tom Schatz, my colleague, who was the head of the UT Film Institute, which was the academic body that was working with Burnt Orange, um, Mm -hmm. attaching the students. And we were true partners in this whole venture with the University of Texas and and Tom is still with the University of Texas but anyway, I remember going to her I think it was like an 8 floor walk up apartment to on election night or something in New York City and there was a a fire alarm and suddenly the building was surrounded by fire engines and we were on an 8 floor walk up and we didn't know what the heck to do. Mm -hmm. Fortunately the building next door was on fire. But anyway, so I've known her for a very long time (laughs) Uh and and we are working together uh, at the present moment on a documentary called The Children of Giant and um, Giant uh, of course is the big movie that we all identify with. And Hector Galin who is um, uh, I I would say arguably um, the United, the North America's most prominent Mexican American filmmaker mm-hmm. um, is directing, and Hector and I are executive producing, and Karen and Evi Gala are producing. You mentioned Karen, but m- minus or accepting Karen, and we know about the light and how pretty the place is, especially if you make movies. But what kept you here, people wise? I'll be honest with you, mm-hmm. I had no idea of the 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 richness of the of the culture. In this community, I mean, I really came here. I was just drawn to this place, mm-hmm. inexplicably drawn to the place. In the ten days that I stayed in Karen's guest house, and she was around for some of it, I started to meet locals. The only locals I had met were Alice Stevens from the the, the flower shop and uh, the plant shop, uh, you know, one stop in Alpine, who was also a location scout. And Alice, I had found through the through the uh, Texas Film Commission, and Alice was taking us around. The director, who was a, 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 an actual Mexican director for this project, the Marfa Lights, a man called Carlos Carrera, very talented. The other producers and myself taking us around to different ranches. We were looking for locations. So the only people I knew were ranchers. And Alice. I found Alice through the University of Texas Film, not the University, through the Texas Film Commission, nothing to do with the University of Texas, the Texas Film Commission. We were looking for people that, you know, if you go to scout locations in an unknown place, an unknown state or city or county, um, in today's world, you usually contact the the film commission of a given state or a given city, and they make recommendations and referrals to you, and you hire someone who does the shortcuts for you, mm-hmm. and they will read the script, and they'll say, <laughs> these are the places you should see, and off you go to look at them. So that was my first exposure, and I came back three times to do that. that but I still didn't, I'd never been to the Chinati Foundation, I'd never been to the Judd Foundation, I didn't know what Ballroom Marfa was. The focus was specifically this film we were going to make, nothing to do with the art community here, which is never referenced in the movie, by the way. Would you say that you're a type A type of personality? I'm never quite sure what that means. 
I'll tell you what it means to me. Yeah. I just mean, I, I uh, unfortunately am not type A, and you can find me hanging out and doing nothing in a variety of locations. But I don't usually see you at those locations. And it seems like the people you know are work-derived, that the, those relationships, and you have, every time I see you, you've managed to keep yourself busy. So I think that type A, if I am not type A, then someone who's opposite of me might be type A. That's what I'm asking about you. Yes. I'm a, <laughs> I am the type A daughter of a type A mother and father. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like your daughter is type A if she's opened up four stores. No, no, that was me that opened four oh, stores. Oh, you did that. Am I talking too fast? No, no, I'm listening to you. My too daughter slow. was Here, nine years there. old. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, am I talking too fast? You want to run some no, of this no, back? No, no, no. Just because I'm incoherent doesn't mean you're speaking too fast. No, no. I, I actually was in partnership with my brother. Okay. And, <laughs> but he didn't live there. He lived in New, Jer- in, mm-hmm. in New York and New Jersey. But my daughter was nine years old when we moved to Jamaica. She well, was that would have made her very type A had she opened up those stores. Extremely type A. Mm-hmm. She didn't even work in those stores. She was just in school. My daughter is not a type A personality. This begs a certain question, because you seem to lead a Los Angeles uh, work life with a Marfa or with kind of a a Jamaican type of social life. That is, you you seem to like the kind of pace of this town as far as going to the post office and eating at a restaurant, but that doesn't seem to have bled into your professional life, which you still do with a lot of diligence. That is true. Not that we're lazy here in Marfa. No, 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 no. But it has to do with pacing. I mean, filmmaking is all about pushing a rock uphill all the time. Mm-hmm. And you have to get up every morning and push that rock. Doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter how many rejections you get. Doesn't matter how hard it is to get things done. You just push and push and push until eventually something happens. Mm-hmm. And you have to be able to do that or you never get movies made. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about something else that is on everyone's mind, but you're the first person I'm bringing it up with. But renting versus owning is kind of, in Marfa, a particularly familiar discussion. Right, right. Well, I rent, and one of the reasons I rent is because my accountant doesn't want me to buy. And one of the reasons he doesn't want me to buy is because I have moved so much in my life. Um... Not specifically by design since I've gotten older, but when I was younger, I was just like, I'm on the road again, another city, Mm -hmm. more mountains to conquer. Now it's not that I really want to move that much, but it is, um, uh, my life just seems, that seems to be my destiny. This is not a town where you sell a house quickly. So um, I've been very, very fortunate since I've lived here to have found two houses that I have rented the first one, and then I moved to my second home where I've been for four years. And Where is Four that? years? No, three years. Three years. Here, obviously, yeah. in Marfa, in the yeah. city. Yeah, on the west side of town. Mm. And, and I really, um, uh, I love the house. And, you know, I, I like being on the edge of town. I don't mm. like being in town. I like being on the edge of town. I like seeing the wildlife. I, have, I had foxes in my backyard all summer long. When I was over on Idis, there was antelope in the front yard all the time. I, I love that. Uh-huh. That's To me, that's part of the joy. Is there anything that's been lost from the Marfa you came to visit in 2007? Or, I mean, things have changed. Things change everywhere. And it's here in Marfa, it's a particular pastime of ours to discuss what's better and what's worse. You know, I, w- I would say the, I, I, the only thing I have any little bit of sadness about is that sometimes uh, people come here and they want to live here, but they're unable to make a living here. And then they leave, and I miss them because I've become friends with them. Um, You know, the odd restaurant, you know, I miss the miniature rooster, I miss the blue javelina, you know. But I can't, uh, I, I don't mind driving to Alpine to the dry cleaners, and you make the adjustment when you get here. I mean, my neighbors... For example, just they moved here from New York City, and then when they first got here, they said, oh, my God, we can't find this, that, and the other. So I would always volunteer when I was going to the city if they wanted me to bring anything back. One one day they asked me to bring them garlic, <laughs> and I said, garlic? <laughs> well, you know, on the airplane, you know, <laughs> go to the 
get-go. I know you can get garlic at the get-go if you don't like the garlic at the supermarket. Anyway, I did actually bring them garlic. I swear this is a true story. I don't want them to hear this on the radio, but I don't care if they do. They'd laugh now. Now if I ask them if they need something, they say, oh, no, we've got everything. Because you, 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 you figure out how to live here when you move here. When you come from the city, mm-hmm. there's so much that's so available to you that it is, um, you have to make an adjustment. Mm-hmm. But honestly, it's an easy adjustment to make. I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, I have not given up television. You Many know friends have given but up let me television. Tell you I have not given up television. I gave up television in 1998. And it, let me tell you the reason. Um, what I was going to say is, yes. <laughs> I think this is just extrapolating. One of the reasons maybe moving here was not difficult for you, such an easy adaptation, is because if you lived in Europe in the 60s, um, when they were still recovering from World War II, getting garlic, you know, was actually an issue, or getting this or that or whatever. And you know, the, the one of the, the most difficult things, when my husband and I first bought, our, when we first started going to Jamaica, when he first took me to Jamaica, it was mm-hmm. during the years when Jamaica had gone socialist and had been uh, had no diplomatic relationship with the United States, mm-hmm. and the country had become so poor because... Um, Oh, I'm momentarily forgetting the name of the prime minister. It'll pop into my brain in a second. But he had aligned himself with Cuba, and it was a no-no. And mm-hmm. and rice is the main staple of the Jamaican diet. You couldn't get rice in Jamaica. Wow. We'd go to Jamaica, and we would take rice with us to Jamaica. Hmm. And that was that was pretty. I mean, and another thing too, living in deep rural Jamaica. Was was much more remote than this. Believe me. Yeah, sure. or probably we, it was more remote. Uh, how should I say this? You weren't probably further away from people. You were further away from like cities. I mean, from the United States, from even uh, Kingston. And- even amenities. I mean, you know, you really did. I I was on the cutting edge of of recycling, because people in third world countries are have to be frugal, and they are frugal. Every plastic bag, for lack of a Better describe every rubber band, every paper clip, every piece of string is saved. Nothing yeah. is tossed. Every there's great respect from for any simple little thing in life, yeah. and you and um, so that was ingrained into me from all of our years. I mean, we had owned a home there for over twenty years. So we we before my daughter and I moved there full time. My husband and daughter and I, my husband and daughter first. My husband and I first, and then my husband and daughter. I were going there. Um, uh, for years, and we'd go every time we could, and we spent as much time there as we could. I love Jamaica. You gave a list, uh, a really impressive list of stuff you've done. It was all successes and stuff that people who listen to this may have heard of, but I'm sure you've been involved with some failures. Of course. And, and they, you've probably learned from them. Gosh. Now, I don't... Here's the thing. I, I am sure I... Certainly I've had tragedy in my life. Um... I've lost a child, I've lost a husband, mm-hmm. I've lost a brother, you know, uh, like many people, lost friends. And of course, now getting older, I'm sadly losing more friends. Um, I, 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 it is my nature to just move forward. So, I process things that have not been successes or been failures, and then I just move forward. So I would really have to stop. I'd really have to spend the night thinking about what I would consider a failure and come back and tell you. You know what that means to me? That that's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. Definitely. Because someone could say, well, the Terrence Malick burnt orange thing was a failure, but someone else would say, no, obviously that was a huge success. That's why I'm talking to you now. That got me here. Yeah. And I think it's that's almost a trick question. Uh, Because it's really how you look at things. And I think that anyone, frankly, who's still alive needs to say that they've had more successes and failures. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, I don't disagree. I mean, certainly we all have disappointments. Oh, my God. We all have disappointments. But disappointment is a much different word. Than failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, you know... Again, and I absolutely am not tooting my own horn in any way whatsoever because I don't consider myself to be someone of extraordinary success, but I do feel like I've had uh, a rich and interesting life. I've met so many interesting people. I love what I do. I had a happy marriage. 
Uh, you know, I've had so much good stuff that um, I have not won an Academy Award, but I've had films that have been nominated. The you know? outrage. Will I you know. <laughs> you know, but so, um, as I say, that... I would have to. I'd have to really go home and make a list for you. Uh, someone told me about the films you'd worked on, and there was one I can't remember that was well before your time. It was uh, just, eight and a half. It was, yeah, eight and a half. The well, Leopard. But you, but you have a connection with it. Uh, I was Claudia Cardinali's, Claudia Cardinali's secretary. I worked on Eight and a Half uh-huh. and on The Leopard. I did a lot. I worked on a lot of the Sconti films. <laughs> I was telling you that people in town associate you with movies you could not possibly be involved with, like, you know, from Edison newsreels to... Uh, but uh, people talk about you being involved with uh, The Harder They Come right. and Countrymen. And uh, I know this will be a little repetition for you, but tell us about your connection, at least with the director of The Harder They Come and with... The, the director of The Hardly Come is a, mm. uh, a man called Perry Hensel, who he and his wife Sally are great friends of my husband and mine. And um, and Chris Blackwell, who founded Island Records, is also a, a great friend of ours. A great friend of my husband's was uh, gave me away at our wedding, mm-hmm. you know, uh, godfather to our daughter. I mean, these are deep friendships. Um, and so Perry and Sally Hensel... And Sally was the art director on Perry's film, On the Heart of They Come. They lived, if you will, down the road from us. Now, down the road from us was like 12 miles down the hill. Yeah. So they lived on an old property called Iatopia, which was an old great house, which was, uh, now I'm going to get real Jamaican on you, it was the Bushes' house on a huge property. Um, and we lived in a small great house 12 miles up the road. And we would visit each other, and we'd swap... Um, cuttings of bushes and flowers. I mean, and we'd put, we'd trade each other's lilies from our lily ponds and, you know, chickens and all kinds of stuff like that. And in Jamaica, because everyone expects you to spend the night if you come so that you can, you know, eat and drink as much as you want. And and so not infrequently, we'd sleep down at Sally and Perry's if we'd gone there for the day and dinner and everything, rather than to have to drive by, back up the hill. Um, I lost my point. What was I telling you? I was asking you about your connection with these. Uh, oh, Jamaican Buck and films. Camp. Buck and, oh, okay. Well, so I, I knew. So I knew Perry really, really well, right. and and we lost him. Sadly, we lost him to cancer a couple of years ago. I did go. I went down for for the memorial service, which was fantastic. It was at Iatopia at their their house. They also owned a fantastic hotel. The family does called Jake's. Mm-hmm. At a little town called Treasure, Treasure Beach, which is on the um, south side of the island, and I went there with Buck and Camp a year ago this month. This is where your friends are now. In I Jamaica? Mean, no, no, here oh, in Marfa, Texas. Yeah. But. Well, I have to say, it was. I mean, I'd always liked Buck and Camp. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say we ever got close or even had a meal, but mm-hmm. there was a there was a. a connection between us. And then Camp, it turned out, was a big Jamaica file. He had seen this film, Countryman, which is a really simple morality tale, which Chris Blackwell produced years ago. Do, do I remember correctly The Countryman actually had, like, magical powers? He did. Yes. <laughs> Chris's dream was to do a kind of a, what the Kung Fu movies did with David Carradine. Yeah. Countryman, which is really the the true name of, is the Rasta guy called Countryman. Well, mm. he, you know, he's He's not really a Rasta guy. People think he's a Rasta guy, but he's not a Rasta guy. He's a fisherman. Mm -hmm. But he has extraordinary, he is like, he is, he is truly gifted. In real life, you're talking about. In real life. And you know this guy. I know him well. You know him him really, really well. Uh I've known him since whenever I've been going to Jamaica. I've watched him grow older because he and his wife, Mama, they're so poor. Even though he was a momentary movie star with, with Countryman. Um, I mean, he, he he only owned a pair of swimming trunks. But, but that that's the, I don't know, the second most famous movie to come out of uh, Jamaica, and he didn't get the the rewards from that? Mm, you know, he got paid a little money. Never None of these films ever really made any money. Yeah. Even The Heart of They Come never really made much money. Mm. Uh, maybe now a little bit more because they've done a stage musical and everything. The two films I produced are the high. I produced three films in Jamaica. Two of them are the highest grossing films ever made in Jamaica. What are they? Third World Cop and Dance Hall Queen. And those are from Jamaican and I'm guessing English audiences? They are they mostly they are Jamaican stories made in Jamaica, financed by Chris Blackwell, 
um, and they primarily play to Jamaican audiences around the world. And the Jamaican audiences reside in Miami, Toronto, New York, and London. The, and, and yeah, I said Toronto. Mm-hmm. There are more Jamaicans outside of Jamaica than there are in Jamaica. These films are hugely popular. Right. And to this, my, one of my proudest moments is that when Dance Hall Queen opened, it opened at the Carib Theater in Kingston, which was an Art Nouveau theater that that was a landmark in Kingston. Every little Jamaican kid, certainly middle-class Jamaican kid, had been taken, been dressed up in their Sunday best and taken to the Carib to the movies as a child. It, we premiered at the Carib, um, and it was a triumph. And I left the next day with my daughter to go visit my mother in North Carolina. I get a phone call saying, Carolyn, Carolyn, something terrible has happened. And I said, what happened? They said, gunmen went to the Carib. I said, oh, my God. Did they hold up the box office? They said, no, them hold up people in line for them tickets because it's a three-week oh wake my. to buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and all the gunmen were coming out of the inner cities and, and holding people up for their tickets so they could go straight into the movie and we wouldn't have to wait. And I said... Not too many movie producers have no, that, that claim. That's a, that's a badge of honor for sure. Not even Bruce Hart. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's see what we got. We, let's do ten more minutes. Okay, I this is not much more for stuff, but no, no, but it's it's, it's a lot of your stuff, and that's yeah. what's important. Um, and you know, before we come back to Marfa, I want to go to Europe a sec. Uh, tell me about Claudia Cardinal. I always thought that she and I would have had something going if we had been in the same time and place. And you worked with her, and I'm sure you can. Um, I, I know her from westerns. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did you work with her on? Um, I. She was just breaking. I had just arrived in Italy, pretty mm. much. We arrived almost the same time. We were both very young, and Claudia's first language was French. E because even though she's an Italian actress, she had been born to Italian parents who lived in um, Tunisia, and she Tunisia is a French speaking colony, mm-hmm. country, um, and she Tunis. won a... Tunis. Yeah. Yeah. Tunisi. I guess that's uh, what the you, Italians call it. You gave it a little flavor. Yeah. Um, and uh, so she, she she won a beauty contest uh, as, a, as a young woman, was taken to the Venice Film Festival and signed by this Italian movie producer. And I arrived at about the same time. And Anyway, I, I won't go into the long story of how I ended up working with her, but I was initially hired to teach her English because they wanted her to be an international mm-hmm. actress. And and after just a few days, we got on so well that they asked if I would become her secretary, and that way she would be speaking English all the time mm-hmm. because I, you know I'd be driving her, I'd be going to fittings with her, I'd be on the set with her, I'd be, you know, wherever Claudia was, I was, and and I would um, oversee her press interviews. And all of that gave me great exposure into the European movie world. Mm. And it was a time when it was right after Cleopatra, with Elizabeth Taylor, and a lot of films were being produced in Europe. Tons of films were being made in Europe. And this was 60s, all of the 60s and entering into the 70s when then the the American boom started, you know, that, that next, that new American wave. And it was also the time of neo, just the end of neorealism in, in Italy, which was, you know, um, uh, the Rossellini films, the Visconti films, the, all those great films that came after World War II. And it was the, it was the new wave in France. And so it was Truffaut and Mal and Godard. And uh, I mean, it was just an astonishing moment to be in the movie business. And they, those were the influences that affected my tastes and sensibilities. And they're very director-oriented yeah. filmmaking. And it's it's different from Hollywood filmmaking. So when I moved back to the States, I gravitated towards the indie world because that was the world that I connected with most strongly. Claudia was... I mean, we were kids, and we were riding around in limousines, and we were going to... You know, through through her, you know, we were were meeting presidents and kings, and she was being presented to to Queen Elizabeth, and we were at fashion houses in Paris, and 
Regine taught me how to twist, and I taught Alain Delon how to twist, and mm-hmm. Anna Magnani how to twist. I mean, that was the world that, 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 that we still, lived in. Can you still twist? You know, I haven't twisted in a long time. I guess if I kind of See, that's put some you, WD-40, you're, I could... <laughs> you're so type A, but you got to get out. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you'd be twisting before you even knew it. I bet I would. It's but I want to do the new thing that the South Korean guy's doing. I can't remember what it's called, The Horse. It was okay. on the Today Show this morning. It's hilarious. you gotta, you got to YouTube it. Okay, it's I'll absolutely it hilarious. My, my thing is the Melrose Shuffle, which is about three years old, but for me, that's... No, this is cutting edge. This is today. <clears throat> okay. Today? I oh can't my do it, but it's like uh, the the thing. Okay, I'll, I'll check it out. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, coming back to Marfa, we let's get down to it. Far Marfa was the movie that I... Uh, Saw around town, and I'm sure there have been, you know, since I've been here, 15 shoots and this and that and whatever. But Far Marfa was really uh, homespun. It was. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun to work on. How did that happen, and how, what was your connection? Um, you know, I first met Corey when he and Robin were started the, the film festival, and I was there one and only advisory board member. <laughs> and so I had a lot of meetings with them the, the three years that they were doing the festival together and and got to know them, and they became friends. And then um, when Corey was doing... Corey had written another script, and he, he would occasionally ask me to read things and, and, and talk to him about them and stuff like that. We became kind of buddies. He did a trailer... I mean, you know, there's, we're, we are a very small group of filmmakers in this town, and we do... We, we bounce things off of each other, you know. And then when he got ready to do this film with Jenny Lynn, who did an awesome job producing it, they asked me if I'd get involved. And of course I would. You know, I try to be helpful to anything that's film-oriented in this town, you know, because mm-hmm. we, we are a very much a fledgling film industry. We will never be an industry, but film is everywhere now. And so, I mean, for example, next week I'm meeting a young director who's coming here to scout locations for something that he or she might do and you know it's just um i mean things go through here that i have nothing to do with and don't happen to meet the people but a lot of things come through and we all connect with them in some way or other did you work on the larry clark film at all i didn't you know i met the first um line producer and then he ended up leaving the picture for some reason, and I never met the new people. I, I, I didn't have anything to do with that shoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the Cinemorpha, which is the, the other film festival? Right. Also? I'm on David's advisory board, uh-huh. and, um, you know, I'm available to he and Jenny, Jennifer if whenever I can do anything to help. I try to. I'm I'm not as involved as I was with with um, film, not film Marfa, what was it called? Uh, Marfa Film Festival. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Marfa Film Festival. I was very involved with that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I certainly... Um, uh, what would you do? This is hypothetical, of course. What would you do if you were doing a film festival here? Um, you know, I've never... I'm not a film festival person. I, am, In other words, I'm not a conceiver of film festivals. Um, but I did... I, You know, I like... Both festivals are very, very diverse. Mm-hmm. Their approaches, their programming... Uh, I think they both did nice jobs, um, and I am more ma- I am quite mainstream, even though I'm an indie person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I look forward to having the opportunity to do some kind of program one of these days. We'll see if that ever happens. Well, I, you know, tying this in with the issue we we're bringing up before about jobs here. I think this is one of the few things that we can compete with. We cannot have like a great fishery here for obvious reasons. But and, and I could go down the list, and there are not a lot of jobs available. But we can attract movies because of the light and because of the reputation and because of the cost. And so I, I see that as something helpful. Well, cost is where you're wrong. The two things, first of all, we don't have any crew here. So mm. any crew that we have, I mean, when I say we don't have any crew, we did manage with Far Marfa. We pretty much crewed with local people, but we did have to bring in our keys I mean, you know, there, there, there are no film crews here. They're just, they're just, there's just us, and we do the best we can. But yeah. it's not like it's a union shop. Good you know? point. Good point. But okay, let me just, as long as we're being hypothetical, if if Marfa was uh, a, a, a film destination, destination. Thanks. Do you think maybe after a few years, some people who are working coffee jobs and whatever would be able to double as film crew? Double. 
Yeah. Double. I think if with some training they could do double. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it would because then you're going to do local hire, and that means you don't have to house them or pay them per diem. You have to still have to give them lunch. Mm-hmm. You don't have to pay travel per diem yeah. and hotel, and all of that is what drives the budget up. Uh, let's do a lightning round. That's a term I've never used before. But this is an, an unique interview in a number of ways. But I'm going to ask you lots of questions quickly because uh, I've we both drink, have to go because I've been drinking this coffee. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you run? I go to the gym. Um, you I were work currently out. dressed as a runner. It's undeniable. Oh, no, because I did come straight from the gym this Nike, morning. Nike, well, you know, these yeah, things. Yeah, I know. Nike. Cool. I'm really yeah. worried about whether Nike uses child labor. But anyway, for now, um, I, I go to the gym twice a week. I work with the trainer, Alan Vanna, who I think is just absolutely excellent. And then I go once a week and I do cardio. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I try and walk once. Uh, I'm not a runner, but I do exercise. Where do we eat? Are I, you a vegetarian? No. Where do you eat? I eat um, I eat at home. Mm-hmm. I eat at Cochineal. I eat at Maya's. I occasionally have a burger at Padre's. I don't eat a lot of meat. I eat a little meat. I eat at Food Shark. I now wait patiently every day for fried chicken at Fat Lyle's. Mm. Um, at, is it Fat Lyle's? Fat yeah. Lyle's. Yeah. Um, those are the primary places that I Can eat. you roller skate or hula hoop? Uh, I used to could roller skate. And I used to could hula hoop. I have not done it in years. Mm-hmm. Uh, why aren't you dancing more in a town that would respect your dancing abilities? Because uh, I don't have a partner. Oh, come on. I could hook you up. Oh, you know, I don't want you to hook me up. I'll hook myself up. Oh, you can hook yourself up with me yeah, is it's what I'm more, Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah. It's much more fun. I mean, I, who goes to a dance without a partner? Although this is one of the few towns, and mm-hmm. this is really worth saying, where you can as a single person, female or male, you can go out and do things, and you can, it is... Um, and you always feel okay about it. Is this your home now? This is absolutely my home now. I have no intention to leave. Okay. Uh, should we let's let's call quits here because we we did a and lot. And I'm going to stage manage Rob Weiner's play Three Penny Opera. I can't do. Uh, let's keep this on because okay. this is important. Yeah. My interest in Three Penny Opera. I don't. I'm not here long enough to be a participant. I go to every. Uh, rehearsal that I can because I find Rob Wiener to be a rare and subtle genius. Yeah. I think this guy is, when you go to the rehearsal, he's teaching you stuff, but he's performing the whole time. Yeah. And he may be performing the whole time, period. Yeah. But he's an extraordinary guy, and that's why I go. I, I love that you're working on this. Well, this is be, I've worked with him three times. This will be the fourth time that I've worked with him. This, this is the gone with the wind of community theater. Yes. This is going to be the most ambitious thing that any small town has ever done. Yeah. In my true A personality um, mode, and with the extreme help of Jenny Lynn Hamilton, I've just put together um, two character breakdowns and scene breakdowns to distribute on Monday when we rehearse again. I hope you'll be there. Because um, we'd, we'd, Rob had gotten to the point where he said uh, he would like a little bit of administrative help, so of course I jumped in. So, but you know, I'm off and on too because I have to do my paying jobs. I understand. We're just messing. Thank you very much. (laughs) My pleasure. (laughs) All right, dude.